this simple chunk of steel with with a handle on it that may or may not fold isn't really what it's about. It's really about who made it, why they made it the way they did, what they were trying to achieve by the design and manufacture of this tool. And they mark moments in time, these knives do, with people who are important to us in the knife community. And that's, uh, that's kind of a neat place to get to in collecting. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Well, hello and welcome to episode number 96 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast that is the place for knife newbies and knife junkies to learn all about knives and knife collecting. Hear from knife designers, makers, manufacturers, reviewers, anyone who loves knives, the Knife Junkie podcast has you covered. And Bob, we're going to go to Knife Church today. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We're talking to the Apostle uh, the Apostle P, Rob Bixby, uh, one of my favorite YouTubers uh, from, uh, I've been watching him for years now. He's famous for his From the Sharpening Bench videos where uh, you know, he's a sharpener, a professional sharpener, and he receives knives from clients all over the place. And they have they send a, a wide variety of knives, so it gives them a unique opportunity to check out a lot of things, make video reviews. But he also has an incredible knife sale. So uh, I've been following Rob for a long time, and it was a great opportunity to catch up with him and, and get to know him a little bit. And we'll get to that interview in just a second, but remind you... As we're going through these trying times with coronavirus COVID-19, you may be doing less in-person shopping and more online shopping. So if you need anything, could be a knife or could be just supplies for your household, please use our affiliate link. We'll get a very small commission, but you won't pay any more for the product that you need to buy. Go to theknifejunkie.com slash shop Amazon, theknifejunkie.com slash shop Amazon. That'll help support the show. And you can get everything you need on Amazon at your normal everyday price without paying any more. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you've got questions or comments, call the 24-7 Knife Junkie listener line at 724-466-4487. I'm here with Rob Bixby, uh, the Apostle P on YouTube. Not only is he a renowned... uh, reviewer of knives, but he is a luminary in the world of sharpening knives. This man quit his day job to sharpen knives, uh, if that tells you anything. Rob, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. Happy to be here, Bob. Thank you for reaching out to me. I'm grateful that you asked and grateful to be here. Well, uh, right right before we started rolling, uh, I start. Uh, I was about to tell you about two videos that you made that changed my... Um, my collecting life. And this this happened probably about five years ago. One of them was called The Progressive Insanity of Knife Collecting, uh, and the other was Knives with Soul. Uh, do you do these videos uh, ring a bell? I mean, you've made a lot. Yeah, those, those two videos are kind of, uh, uh, they were videos that sort of ruminated and marinated inside of me and, and just sort of had to be made at one point. And they kind of, they kind of illustrate the journey of a knife collector and the hobby. And I, I tried to make them because I was hoping that uh, they would help explain to people who were developing the addiction why these things were happening to them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they go hand in hand. It's it's like one's yeah. a justification for the other. Yeah. So Knives with Soul uh, especially, you know, uh, progressive insanity of knife collecting, you kind of – you kind of uh, – sort of detail the journey of uh, going from a, a, a Walmart uh, purchased Kershaw leak, for instance. I can't remember the exact uh, knives, but you you take it up, you know, a notch or two to Spyderco and then and then to Benchmade, and then suddenly you're spending, you know, 500 bucks on a CRK. Or eight of them. Or, or eight yeah, of them. Yeah. And, and that sort of made it feel, uh, okay, I'm not the only one. And then the knives with Soul, you know, it's like, I realized I have four hinderer zts why not just trade them in and get a real hinderer after your video and and so it inspired me to uh do a little bit of uh refining in in how i look at things yeah and i think that concept is kind of uh 
it's something we start to ponder as we mature in collecting when we sort of graduate from uh, running out to buy whatever we saw three guys have on Instagram this week <laughs> because three other guys had it. And we graduate from that sort of uh, that kind of mob collecting mentality to really starting to discern what's important to us and why in the knives that we that we covet, so to speak, mm-hmm. the knives that the knives that we want to own. Um, and I think the longer we go collecting knives, and the more people that we start to talk to, the connections that we make, especially when we start to meet guys who make knives Mm -hmm. Um, we start to realize that the this simple chunk of steel with with a handle on it that may or may not fold isn't really what it's about it's really about who made it why they made it the way they did what they were trying to achieve by the design and manufacture this tool and they mark moments in time these knives do with people who are important to us in the knife community and that's uh that's kind of a neat place to get to in collecting. Yeah, uh, at, you you might develop an appetite for innovation. You know, uh, collecting knives by what's unique about them, and maybe holding on to them even though you don't carry them, just because it's the Bob DeMarco Museum of Knives, and you're exactly. curating. You, you hold on to it because it's significant, not necessarily because you use it every day. Right, right. Yeah. And there's also a problem in that there are no places to buy knives around uh, where I live. You know, I live near a major metropolitan area, and, uh, you know, just knives are not tolerated around here. And oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so I can't sorry. go to the, yeah. <laughs> I know. I can't just go to my local neighborhood knife store and, and just pick something up and try it out. If, if a design catches my eye and I'm a total esthete, I'll admit it right up front. I will, uh, buy it and then have it and ooh and ah over it. And then I should really sell this thing. I, I, I just wanted to check it out. Okay. So for those of you who didn't catch that, Bob said he is an esthete. <laughs> so he's one who appreciates the aesthetics of a knife. I mean, let's face it. People here in the Midwest where I live, Bob, we don't, we don't really know words like that. Oh, well, <laughs> You know, so there might be some people in the middle of the country listening. So, well, you know, you 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 watch any uh, or listen to any knife uh, video, and they talk about aesthetics. So I figured it's the they did, uh, yeah. It's like it's athlete. A, you know, uh, Jules from Pulp Fiction would say, "Check out the big vocabulary <laughs> on Bob." Oh yeah, man. Oh I, hey, I, there's a word for everything. There is, there is. especially in our crazy language. Yeah, absolutely. I used to. I, I remember one time giving uh, giving Jim Skelton a little bit of uh, <laughs> giving him a little bit of ribbing because he he had a knife that was a bronzy purple color, oh, and he yeah. called it aubergine. Oh, aubergine. Well, that's 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 French for eggplant. That is exactly yeah, <laughs> which is which is now a pornographic fruit. I that's so weird. I, I I can't I can't get with that. Yeah. So. You've detailed in your videos your progress or your uh, uh, how your life has changed from being a car salesman to being a full time sharpener. It take us through that a little bit. Yeah, and you know I'd love to tell you, you know, I'd love to write the the uh, retrospective book on how to be successful in knife sharpening and tell you that I planned all that. <laughs> but so here, here's what happened, and people who have been following me for a long time know that. In 2009, I was a I was a recovered drug addict and alcoholic for about 20 years, and through all that, staying sober and clean, um, didn't really have a relationship with God. And so, at this point, I'm I'm 15 years in the car business, running a dealership, and uh, and I'm a new Christian. And for the next six years, I struggled trying to reconcile. Although we were a pretty ethical, uh, a pretty, we were an extremely ethical business for a car dealership. Still, the decisions I was helping people make didn't match what didn't match what Scripture said we should do with God's resources. And I, for the last few years, I did that for a living. It was just it got increasingly difficult to go to work every day. And uh, one day, I had a, a long talk with the owner of my store and. 
he knew my heart wasn't in it anymore. And we were having a moment of honesty. And I said, you know, Jay, I, I just don't think I can do this anymore. And, and we need to make arrangements for me to get out of here. And I need to go do something else. And at that time, I was sharpening part time. And I knew I had more work than I could handle. And I, you know, I was controlling my workflow by not answering emails. Mm. Brilliant, right? <laughs> um, so I thought maybe maybe this is God telling me it's time. And so I made a decision to hand him the keys and walk away and did a video and said, I'm going to sharpen full time now. And I don't think my backlog has been under three weeks since September oh, of 2015. Wow. Yeah. So I've been richly blessed and uh, a way has been provided for me to kind of maintain close to the same level of income uh, by sharpening knives in a, in a pretty good way for people. And, and also uh, to augment that, he kind of put in my path something I thought I was never going to do again, which was <laughs> sell things. So and you may know, I think you do know that yeah. every Thursday night at nine o'clock, we have a, a knife sale on my YouTube channel and, I love and that helps videos. a little bit too. It's, it's kind of cool. Since we're there, how did you get involved with that? Uh, that's a great story. Those of you who have been around the YouTube knife community for a while may know the name Toad Sticker, <laughs> T-O-A-D-S-T-K-R, who is a gentleman named Rick who lives in Washington State. And he is a, an old and dear online friend of mine. And uh, at some point a few years ago, I think b this was before I stopped selling cars. He called me one day and said, I'm having some medical issues. I got too many knives. Do you think you could do a sale on your YouTube channel and get me some money? And I said, sure, we can try. And I, I think he sent me a dozen knives. And like a true novice, as I was, I made a video and turned it on public at like nine in the morning on a Friday while oh. I was at work. Uh oh. And so I got no work done for the next four hours. <laughs> and uh, I went, hmm, I guess people really will buy knives this way. But I knew it, I didn't really have a taste for doing that. When I, when, I, when I handed the boss the keys to the dealership, I never wanted to sell anything again. All right. But I did some favors for people and sold some knives and, and then I'm just getting besieged with requests from would-be consigners. And I don't know, I guess for the last three and a half years, we've had a knife sale every Thursday, except for weeks I've been on vacation. And they, they don't stop coming in, so I keep keep making videos. So where do they come from? Do, do you have just different sources who have uh, their hands on a lot of knives or who know a lot of people? Or No, they're individual collectors, Bob. They're, they're guys who, whose collections have either gotten out of hand from mm -hmm. a volume standpoint, or and we understand this, they've they've matured in their taste, or they've mm -hmm. they've evolved in what they want to collect, and in order to fund their next purchases, they need to get rid of stuff. And some people, I guess, uh, some people kind of get out of the hobby, and they want to they want to cash that stuff. So. 95% of what you see on my on my weekly sale are knives from individual collector consigners. Occasionally I throw a couple of mine in that cuz cuz I need to do that, you know. I right, need sure. To. And then I've had a couple buddies who are uh who are retailers who you know, have stuff laying around in the back that they just need to cash and they don't want to put it on their website. So I, I love to just watch the videos because, first of all, I love how you um, how you describe them and how you, uh, you know, I, I from watching your knife review videos, I have a, a good idea of what your tastes are and you don't need to advertise them. I, I pretty much know how you feel about what's coming out. Yeah. Uh, so I just like to watch the knives and, and, and kind of get in that zone. Uh, I've never gotten anything, never bought anything from a sale, though I came close recently. There was a, uh, there was a fixed blade fighter. Uh, it was a, it was, I, it was a custom. I can't remember exactly. Yeah, that was in that large batch of customs that I had. That took me weeks to get rid of. Yeah. You re, you reposted yeah. it and I was, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get yeah. it. And then I just didn't. Now I can't remember who made that knife. I was kind of surprised it didn't sell because it really wasn't that expensive for a custom. 
No, it wasn't. And it was very cool. I, the only thing I imagine is that it was double-edged and a lot of people just yeah, don't yeah. want to deal with the headache. It had that bayonet grind in it. Yeah, yeah, exactly with that nice jumping. But I want to back up uh, to the sharpening some more. Tell me, how did how did sharpening itself become part of your knife hobby? And then where did your addiction come from in the first place? Okay, so my addiction was spawned at age nine. Hmm. My My uncle, who married my aunt, was sort of a uh, he was sort of a redneck from Tennessee, and uh, he was a knife guy. And I I remember he carried on his hip a buck one ten, and every now and then, like you know, for special occasions, he had this really nicely engraved Browning, a similar folding hunter that was a little cooler than the buck even. And uh, he knew I ogled those knives, and one day when they came to visit, he brought me kind of a miniature version of a buck 110. It wasn't a buck. It was a, and those of you who have been around a long time will know this brand. It was a Jet Dash Air, A-E-R, Folding Hunter, a company that's been extinct for a long time. Very well-made Japanese knife. And I cherished that knife and I learned to sharpen. He taught me a lot. And, you know, back then I sharpened on natural whetstones. Mm -hmm. Um, this is before we knew about Japanese water stones, you know, this back in the late seventies, early eighties. So, you know, I was never a prolific collector throughout, you know, before I was 30, cause I didn't have any money, mm -hmm. but I, uh, I always had knives and I always sharpened them myself and sharpened my buddy's knives. About 2009, I discovered YouTube and, uh, I stumbled across this little channel you, you may have heard of. Nothing fancy. Oh, yeah, yeah. I yeah. think I heard of that one. Uh, yeah, he, little little tiny YouTube channel. And he was a knife nut. I'm like, well, he's like as nuts about this stuff as I am. And I think I might know more than he does because I've been doing this a long time. And I started, you know, clicking around. I'm like, well, he's not the only one. <laughs> you know, there, there are other people doing these videos and people watching them. And so I started reviewing knives. And, uh, after a while, you run out of your own stuff. So I thought, you know, I need to figure out a way to get more knives in here without buying them. So maybe I'll sharpen knives and then review the knives I sharpen. And I thought, well, some of these are pretty expensive and you can make mistakes freehand. So I went on this, the quest for a fixtured system that I thought I would do well with and ended up buying an Edge Pro Apex because... It was sort of a neat hybrid between uh, between touch and hand control and a guided system. Hmm. It's it's I still prefer it to anything else out there. So and I and I bought one of those so I could be precise, not make mistakes that damage people's knives, and I got to really love it. And I I didn't know if this was going to work. I'm asking people to send me expensive collectible knives in a box with money and hope they get them back. <laughs> hmm. And enough people did. And I did a good enough job that, um, that more people did. And then all of a sudden I'm, you know, working 55 hours a week at my regular job and I've got five weeks of backlog of other people's knives and some had to give. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I remember you used to, uh, you showed off edges you put on your own knives a lot. Yeah. Uh, after you got that. And that was really, uh, you know, that was the that was the seller right there just to see those mirror polished edges. Yeah. So uh, for a beginner, what would you recommend a beginner pick up for a beginner? And uh, this this will be hard for beginners to hear. I would say it's it's kind of like playing golf. You can't spend a thousand dollars on a driver and and. Uh, and hit the ball like Brooks Kepka. It doesn't matter. It, you can buy one at a garage sale for five bucks and hit it badly, and you can buy a thousand dollar driver and hit it badly. Mm. So, same thing with sharpening. I would say if you're a, a dead beginner, buy yourself an inexpensive two sided Japanese waterstone, you know, a medium and a fine. Either use your own or go to the garage sale and buy a bunch of hacked up kitchen knives and learn you know watch some videos 
understand the concepts, understand what it is you're trying to achieve, and let your brain and your fingers learn to communicate with each other and achieve that desired result. You can't buy a, you cannot buy a sharpening system to make you to take you from novice to expert just by using that system. Hmm. Impossible. Not even the Spiderco sharp maker. Now that's the Spiderco sharp maker is one of the most misleading tools there is. Hmm. Do, do tell, please. Well, for one thing, uh, it doesn't really work as as it's described in the literature. Very, you know, it, it's got a 15 degrees per side end and a 20 degrees per side end. The number of production knives that are really sharpened at 15 degrees per side with a 20 degree micro bevel are zero. Even spider coats aren't uh-huh. sharpened. That way. So you're, and, and it comes with a set of medium rods and fine rods. So if, if, if I take a hinderer that's sharpened at about 25 degrees per side, that, yes, really, that obtuse. <laughs> And I take it to my sharp maker and I follow the instructions. I'll be there for a month before I ever get an apex at 15 degrees per side. And my bevel will be a quarter inch wide. So I think this, the, the sharp maker is an extremely good touch up tool. Hmm. Okay. So let's say I've sharpened a knife at, uh, and it's a modern super steel, which that thing has a hard time cutting with the factory rods. I've sharpened it at 17 degrees per side with a 20 degree per side micro bevel. And a month later, I got some micro chips and I want to go in and kiss that apex at 20 degrees per side, the fine rods and maybe buy some ultra fines in the sharp maker are great for kissing that, that micro bevel. That's what it's best at. Okay. Okay. As a major sharpening system. No. So what I'm hearing is there's no way to avoid doing what you have to do and starting from starting from the ancient stone. There's no there's no easy uh, easy way to start. Yeah, I, I I believe that's true because if you don't know what it is you're trying to achieve with that steel getting it to an apex, it doesn't matter how good the system is. You don't you don't know how to use it. You don't right. know what what it is you're asking it to do. Right. It's like it's like a painter who paints abstraction without being able to paint figuratively. It's like they don't even know what they're abstracting. There you go. You're exactly right on the money. And and make mistakes. You got to make a, that's why I say use the cheap knives you get at a garage sale. You're going to mess up some knife blades. You know, you're going to wipe the whole face of the blade with scratches. You're going to, yeah. you're going to sharpen off the apex. You just spent half an hour getting to. So that's funny that you say scratches. Uh, scratch up the face of the blade with so i recently got a kme and i've been noodling around with uh with with some of my uh, less valuable knives knives that mean less to me with that kme and i don't know how it's happening but it's scratching up the surface of my blade even though you know when i do it slowly and i look um you know from the side there's no way it's touching. It's just not touching. But somehow it is touching. Is, something is moving. Yeah. And how, how old are your stones? Are you using the diamond? Uh, the, they're they're brand new, and okay. one of them is a diamond. Yeah. So they're flat. It's not like yeah. they're all dished out. Exactly. Yeah, some something's moving around on you. <laughs> um, yeah. 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 I've had I've had a KME in my possession since October. And the reason there's a reason it's been five months and I haven't done a video. I'm having a very hard time. Um, I'm having a very hard time putting it in the best light I can because it has a lot of shortcomings. Hmm, interesting. Um, in in many ways, the KME system is extremely well built. The quality and variety of abrasives they have is really good, but it has some serious limitations. But uh, so I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to organize my thoughts in a way I can explain what it works best at, without, um, without blowing, you know, blowing smoke up anybody's dress. Wow. Um, but uh, it's a, it's a neat product. It's really good at doing what it does. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I look forward to seeing that because I'm wondering, yeah. uh, you know, I've watched a number of videos and I, I just think maybe it's because I'm not doing it consistently that I'm not. Uh, then I'm kind of jacking it yeah. up a, a little and bit. Th- that's there's something to that, Bob. There really yeah. is. 
So the, these from the sharpening bench videos, to me, it seems like uh, a, a sweet setup. You get you get the knives in, you get to check them out, uh, you get to sharpen them, see how see how the steel is, uh, you know, on any given knife. You can quite possibly do some reconnaissance on on your own future purchases this way. It's kind of a nice position to be in. It is, it is on that uh, from that standpoint. There have been some unintended consequences of that arrangement, though, and I'm sure you have noticed the frequency of my knife reviews has dropped markedly in the last couple of years, and I haven't done any negative reviews or very negative reviews in a very long time. Here are the unintended consequences. I'm 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 doing a video on somebody else's knife, number one, so. If if I really don't like it, do I want to do a scathing video on something that somebody's really proud of that I know? Hmm. You know, he knows it's his knife in my hand. Right. I don't I don't want to wreck his his honeymoon. That's one one aspect that has compromised my objectivity. The other is I may have one of these to sell next month. I mean, let's be honest. I I can't be. I'm I'm kind of painted into a corner as a reviewer because of how I've chosen to make my living. So I do positive reviews on knives that really impress me at this point. You know, I think on the whole, that's what most of us want to see anyway. Yeah. You know, um, uh, there, there, I'm sure there are um, exceptions, especially if there's a knife that's super hyped and expensive and and whatever, and and there are some glaring flaws with it. People might want to know that, but on the whole, um, a, a lot of us want um, uh, sort of a purchase commiseration. You know, oh God, I just I just spent four hundred dollars on a knife, uh, and I know Rob likes it. Let me go watch the video yeah, on it again. <laughs> well, that and it's absolutely true. And you know, you know, you know the industry I came from, automakers. They don't advertise to sell these cars next week. They advertise to keep the customer that bought them last month mm. to make that guy feel good about the 50 grand that he spent on that truck. Right. So, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. So people get online to watch. A lot of times they've already bought a knife and they, they want to watch 10 videos where 10 respected people say it's great. I, I do it. I do it. I admit it. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it. Also, it, it also helps in the psych up factor because I get... Um, I, I don't buy too many, not well, some people uh, would, would, would say that I'm, I'm uh, talking, I'm talking trash, but I feel like I don't buy as many knives as I used to. I just buy fewer, more expensive, more, uh, you know, in my, in my wheelhouse now. Speaking of wheelhouse, I'm sorry. I, I just have to ask you, how, how yeah. did you, your criteria for judging a knife? How did oh, you come wow. up with it? And, and what are they? Wow, that's a great question. First of all, and I think you know you know my my subjective criteria well enough. It's got to be a knife. It can't be a cartoon. You know, it has to be a cutting tool. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, nightmare ground r recurve tantos with quarter inch blade stock that weigh eight ounces and fold up and have a pocket clip. I'm yes, never going to give that. I'm never <laughs> going to give that knife a good review. Gotcha. Um, it has to reflect that its maker understood it's a tool. So that that's number one. It has to be an effective cutting tool. It has to have a well-designed handle that presents the blade to the work in an efficient manner. It has to be a handle that's comfortable. So it's it for me, it's definitely a form follows function criteria when it comes to design. I don't necessarily get super excited about exotic materials, especially on modern folders, because there again, it, it's got to be a tool. I mean, how, how many guys are uh, breaking down boxes all day with their Mokutai inlaid titanium frame lock? Right. So y you can see why I, I sort of have gravitated to Spyderco and Benchmade in my life as far as production knives. So well heat treated steel, good blade geometry that achieves the desired application of the knife mechanisms that that hold up um, and you pro you may know this about me i'm never been very enthusiastic about ball bearing flippers mm -hmm. um, 
I think the way, the position your hand has to be on a handle to operate a flipper puts it in a bad position to hold the knife. I don't care if my knife drops shut. <laughs> I, I mean, I like to be able to fl- uh, to pull back the bar on an access lock and fling it shut with my wrist. But if I'm if I'm holding my knife and vibrating to make the blade shut, uh, that's not a criteria for me. It's just not right. And I, I don't think ball bearing mechanisms are robust over time, which brings me to my next criterion, which would be, is this a knife that I'm going to be able to use for a lifetime and pass down to my son? Did a company make it who's going to be there in 20 years mm-hmm. and I'm going to be able to send this knife in and have, and regardless of how much, how much money it costs, if any, is it going to be serviced by the company who made it? That's a huge deal. If you're paying more than 30 bucks for a pocket knife, you know, if it's something that you actually treasure and respect, how long can you treasure it and respect it? And is its maker going to be there to repair it or restore it for you when the time comes? That's another big criteria, which, and you can kind of see where I'm going with that. Yeah. Nameless, faceless guy in China who's got a CNC machine doesn't fit that criteria. So this this kind of uh, fits in with the knives with soul concept exactly. Yeah, and so the, I, I wanted to ask you about Riot, We Best Tech, Reich. You know these knives that are, are these companies that are making these uh, these uh, really e- exceptionally produced knives. Uh, what's your opinion of them? I I, I, I well, I, it's a loaded question. I know it that is. you, so, I know that you're not crazy about them, but. Um, well, l- let me answer first by saying this. Mm-hmm. I would love to meet David Dang. I would really love to meet him. Anything I say that's negative about knives produced in China has nothing to do with my personal like or dislike from of any of the people involved because I don't mm-hmm. know them. Right. You know, I got macroeconomic issues with with the way the Chinese do business and. It's I'm I'm kind of saddened by the fact that they've decided to target the the Western knife industry because hmm. um, it's causing damage to people uh, who have to live in in level playing field economic environments. It's it's nothing personal and it, it's certainly nothing ethnic. It's hmm. uh, I mean and I, you're probably aware if you've watched me long enough. I absolutely dig. Uh, Japanese and Taiwanese craftsmanship and buy products from there all the time. Yeah, those are your favorite spider codes, right? Yeah, probably so. Yeah. Um, but the way China does business globally is so unethical. The way that they handle intellectual property is so unethical. I, just, I don't feel when I, uh, when I buy a Chinese knife, I don't have any pride of ownership. Right. Interesting. And maybe I would if I personally knew some of these guys, but. It's just if I'm going to drop three, four, five hundred dollars on a knife, it's just not going to be one of those. Yeah, gotcha. Having said that, if a, if a friend of mine comes to me and says, "Rob, I got twenty five bucks to spend and I need a pocket knife," is there a chance I'm going to say you need to go buy a rake? Absolutely. Yeah, because it, it might be the best twenty five or thirty dollar knife you can buy, and he needs a good knife for twenty five or thirty bucks. So yeah. So a part of what really drew me into, um, well, Riot uh, uh, and and we uh, were the collaboration knives. Wow, I have an opportunity to own a um, to own a, a Kirby Lambert, a personal favorite of mine. I love his designs. Yep, yep. And uh, and and uh, I ended up buying one on the secondary market, a um, um, Crossroads. And everything about it, like there's, I can't point to anything that I don't like about it or anything that. Well, except the little blue hardware I don't care for, but that's a per- matter of taste. There's nothing about the knife that is lacking, except I just never reach for it, <laughs> you know? And I, Kirby Lambert didn't make it. Yes, yes. It, 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 is, it is his lines, but in a, in a sense, and, and this is something in my own collecting that I'm getting over, in a sense, I can just appreciate looking at a picture of it until I can have one of his own with mammoth ivory like I want, you know? So... Yeah, exactly. I, I should be content with that. We should be. Yeah, we should be. There's kind of an issue. 
we're t- we're 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 tangentially bumping into here when it comes to uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the market and secondary market and values and where they're trending. Mm-hmm. And it's not just Chinese stuff. Pretty much everything that is CNC produced that, that let's say five years ago, we called it a custom quote unquote. And three years ago, we called it a mid tech quote unquote. It's pretty hard now to sell a CNC produced knife for 800, 1000, 1200 bucks. People are starting to realize they can make as many of these as they want to. And look what's happened to Hinder in the last five years. Hmm. You buy a new Hinder for four hundred bucks. Uh, six months later, you'd sell it for seven. They build a new factory. Every website has three hundred Hinders in stock, and the Hinder that you paid four twenty five for last month is now worth three hundred bucks. Yeah, right. It's just the natural way of things, and collectors are starting to get wise as as to what that $800 CNC-made knife can become three years from now. Um, so the, the what I would call the high-end CNC folder, the secondary market for that stuff is kind of in free fall. Mm. And, yeah. and the, the Chinese brands especially. I would not want to be a retailer with fifty thousand dollars of three hundred dollar a copy Chinese knives in inventory right now. I've I've actually noticed that in my own reselling of my yeah, own exactly. knives. And you can't believe the counseling sessions I have with consigners. Really? I got a ray out that I paid three ninety four last year. I think we can get three fifty. It's like new. Well no. Probably a hundred and eighty. Two and a quarter, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. I have these these discussions weekly with people. That's got to hurt. That's got to hurt, you know? Uh, yeah. You know, it was it was a hard discussion to have the first hundred times I had it. <laughs> now I just sort of just come out with it because nine times out of ten, the guy's like, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, traditional knives. That, that's how I discovered you. Um, I started uh, getting into traditional knives and uh, – um, I don't remember how I discovered GEC. Maybe it was from your videos, but uh, I want to talk about your love of traditional knives, and I also oh, want to yeah. talk about your collaborations. Uh, you know, you've you've made knives with Bark River knives. You've made uh, knives with uh, Great Eastern Cutlery. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, tell me, how did your love of traditional knives blossom in this era of uh, modern tactical folders, so to speak? And Actually, uh, I found out about Great Eastern Cutlery and having discussions about case knives with a friend of mine. And he said, you know, there's this company up in Pennsylvania. They they make knives and they're, they sort of make them the old way. They're a little more expensive than case knives. And they come in these cardboard tubes. I'm like, what on earth are you talking about? So he he sort of pointed me to the place to get information. And I started looking at their website. And reading about them, I'm like, oh, my. (laughs) So I called them. And uh, that was before Christine Tucker retired from GEC. And I told her who I was. And and so I'd like to come visit and did a tour on video and met Bill Howard and his son, William, and uh, went through the plant. There were some interesting stories that day. and, And I was just enthralled with the process. You know, uh, we're used to seeing uh, seeing CNC machinery now. Well, they had these two bevel grinders that were programmable mechanically with wow. dogs and acme threaded rods that turned, and you put a knife in a in a in a clamp in there, and it comes out ground on both. Sides. I mean, it was unbelievable. And like two guys in the world knew how to maintain and set up these machines, and their names were both William Howard. Unbelievable. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm getting ready to leave the plant that day, and Bill had been pretty tense as I'm walking around his factory with a camera. And when it was all put away, then he was, you know, then he was relaxed. And I said to him as we left, I said, uh, I said, Bill, this is in 20, this was in 2015. I said, uh, answer me honestly. I said, 10 years ago, when you mortgaged everything you had, 
and started this company. Left Queen, started this company on borrowed money. I said, did you have any idea that 10 years later we'd be in the midst of a traditional pocket knife renaissance and Great Eastern Cutlery would be at the, at the head of it? And he looks at me without hesitation and says, that was my plan. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. that was my plan so i've been in love with him ever since and um i've got a buddy down in florida who is a way he, he is an encyclopedia of traditional pocket knives steve denton how about the truth yeah he you used to do those me, videos with him right and i he just sent me one bob i've cool. got a, i've got 20 pounds of traditional knives in a oh. box so with I don't know, a hundred pages of notes that we're, so we're going to get back on the traditional knives anthology forthwith. Oh, nice. That'll be yeah. a, a, a welcome return. It, w- it will be. I'm really looking forward to opening the treasure chest. Tell me about your uh, knives, the knives you've designed and had produced. So one, one so far with Great Eastern Cutlery. There's, I hope, I hope we get to do another one this year. That was the, uh, the number 74 pattern, which is a three and seven eighths inch curved handled trapper. We did in a single blade with a muskrat clip and called it the Heartland Clip. And that was, uh, we did two covers, Autumn Gold Jig Bone and Gabon Ebony. And there's actually, one of them popped up on eBay this week and the guy wants $400 for it. Yeah, I, I am not yeah. surprised. And so I'm, I'm really, I need to, I need to really sit down with Bill and try to get another one going. And then, uh, we've done two versions of a knife with Bark River, uh, that started with, the, with the Bob Lovis, Loveless inspired Mike Stewart designed Coke bottle trademark Bark River handle, the gunny knife. And I lengthened the blade and broadened it by about three sixteenths of an inch top to bottom. And made it a clip point because I love clip points, <laughs> and it's the that's the gunny sidekick. We ran it the first time in uh, CPM M4, which Mike Stewart wanted to kill me for. That's your favorite steel, right? It is, but it just it, it drives them crazy. They have to change the whole order of their process because, uh, yeah, because it's so hard, right? It's I mean, so hard. Yeah. Okay. They have to. Uh, uh, Normally, they have an outsource for bevel grinding, so that their convex knives start like a saber flat grind, and then mm-hmm. they shape them. Yep. Their normal process is to have the bevel grinding done post-heat treat. You can't do that with M4. You get, there's too okay. much material to remove. Right. So, yeah, we did one in M4, and then last fall, one in CPM 3V. And I think a week ago... I did a video announcing that finally we're doing a stainless gunny sidekick. In 154, in, one of my CPM favorite steel. 154. Yeah, and I, I think, and Mike agrees, For as far as the, the population of modern powdered metallurgy stainless steels, it's the best application for a fixed blade. Hmm. It's the, the right mix of toughness and edge retention. Right. Ah, okay. So uh, in the evolution of that design, I'm sorry, what's it called? Again, the gun, gunny sidekick, the gunny sidekick. So uh, just impressions of my memory of the design. The first one, the first one had a big, beautiful V shaped uh, or A shaped sharpening choil. The second one got, got quite small. And then the third version, this 154 CM version seems to split the difference. Oh, it'll be it'll be exactly the same as the 3V. Exactly. This, which was the last one. Right. Right. OK. The, the smaller one. The smaller one. The knife that you might have been looking at and thought it was in the middle mm-hmm. was my prototype. Okay. So what was the uh, what was behind the choice of shrinking okay. that? Aesthetics. Oh. Um, now you're talking my language. <laughs> yeah. Really, the first knife, the the first the M4 knife, I designed that choil to be exaggerated. It was kind of my way of sticking it to the man, Bob. Oh, I like so that. many knives are made with misused or poorly executed sharpening trails. I kind of wanted to oh. show people this is what this is supposed to do. <laughs> it was ex- it was exaggerated. It was like it was here's the sharpening choil. You can actually sharpen <laughs> it all the way to the back without the plunge grind getting in the way ever. 
Yeah. Um, but it was too big. And I think Mike cringed when I drew it. And I, <laughs> I said, make them that way anyway. And he's like, whatever, you better sell them. <laughs> but we did. And then he was very happy to hear me say, do you think we could make it smaller on the next one? I said, I was going to do that anyway, <laughs> but I'm glad gonna... you said that. Mike Stewart, uh, I, I love his videos. I love Bark River Knives. I don't have many. Uh, actually, I only have one right now, and it's it's a small sax. It's a bush sax. Oh, I love dude. this knife. Yeah, I bet you do. Yeah, this is my, my desk knife. This is my little, I just love it. Yeah, that's a cutting machine. It is. It's yeah. incredible, and it's got this amazing piercing tip. Uh, but I also have a, a Bark River made... Um, Blackjack? Blackjack. Uh one one dash seven. That is so yeah. sweet with the with the uh micarta handle with the cone uh, cone well, shape. Mic. Let me tell you the best review of that knife you're ever gonna hear. Okay. If you call Randall Made Knives and say I want a, I want a model one seven inches long, they'll say, Okay. It'll be about six, maybe seven years. And you say, Really? That long? Are there any available used? They'll say, yeah, they're about fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars. Oh, as as you pucker, <laughs> the guy on the other end of the phone will say, actually, for a little less money than you're going to pay us in six years when your knife is done, there's a company who makes the Model One in the seven inch length, and it might be a better knife than you're going to get from us. Oh man. And you'll say, well, what is it? And they'll say, well, it's a blackjack. Some guy named Mike Stewart in Escanaba, Michigan makes them. Yeah. They're, uh, Randall made have, heartily endorses the people that they allowed to use that that pattern. About that. That is yeah. That is so cool. The, the only thing I, I uh, the only thing I would change on on the copy I have, the version I have, is I would make the uh, the back sharp you know the uh, i would sharpen the swedge but that's just because i i get into that kind of thing uh -huh. and uh i think all randalls like all randalls the swedge is sharpened yeah or at least very close to being sharpened yeah beautiful looking knives i love the i love the history and the mythology behind them but i've never uh i've never owned one and you know probably won't yeah that, you know one of the things that people really don't understand unless they've held one and used them is they grind them thin oh yeah yeah they, they they use a hollow instead of a convex or a flat and they're pretty thin behind the edge uh now their edge is it's sort of a blank canvas edge and they will tell you that okay we bring it to an apex at a pretty obtuse angle because people who buy and use our knives know how they're going to sharpen them anyway Right, right, yeah. and then and then those who are just collecting them don't necessarily need them with a right. with a wicked sharp edge anyway. Yeah. Uh, so um, I wanted to get to you did a video on the uh, what are being called the HRC police, and I, I wanted to I wanted to get your take here about that about the um, the idea of you know people testing for themselves and and. And what that information, you know, might garner. How you feel about yeah, that? Um, that whole situation has taken so many twists and turns since I tried unsuccessfully to help. <laughs> uh, it's a complex subject. And the, the question really is, is it better to have objective scientific data or is it better to have anecdotal um, at home testing, um, and uh, you can make the case either way. The problem becomes when we we when we're when we think we're going to do quote unquote objective scientific testing, and use sample sizes that are statistically insignificant, and we're using methods methods and equipment that aren't correct. We're not producing any data that tells us anything. But because we we have what what we present as objective numbers, and we we say the word scientific, people start to uh, put more credence in some of that testing than than it deserves to have. Um, 
and that that continues to go on in that community. I really, I don't want to get too deep into that, but mm-hmm. um, I, I did that stuff for a living. I was, I was the guy who made a thousand hardness tests a day and signed certifications that went to government agencies. And um, so it was easy. For, it was pretty easy for me to identify and shake my head when I saw what they were doing. And uh, Anyway, here's the deal. When we boil this down to its essence, why do we have why do we have super steels in the market? So people don't have to sharpen. No, so people will buy them and pay too much money. That's why we have them. Uh, yes, right? yes. Well, and here's why I say that: you you use your knives, right? What what causes you to have to sharpen them? Is it gradual erosion of the apex of the edge, or is it because you? Ran it into something, twisted it, chunked it, chipped it, tipped it. Which one of those is really what causes you to sharpen your knives? Sport and fun because it's relaxing to me. But outside of that, it's usually because I've been stupid outside in the backyard and you damaged it, right? It's not edge retention is almost a ridiculous measuring standard because we run it into a staple, uh, we go to cut a nylon zip tie and torque the blade and it chips we drop it tip on concrete Mm. Uh, we're cutting cardboard full of sand and dirt and we run our fingers across the edge we're like oh i didn't even remember doing that it's not because it's not because perfectly heat treated m390 will make 25 passes through cardboard more than s35 vn that's not why our knives need sharpen it's because the real world damages the edge so a lot of the stuff is completely meaningless and the best knife to me is one that's the best balance between edge retention and ease to sharpen and the keenness of the edge it will take and everybody who makes a knife is going to make that judgment for himself when he treats that steel to his spec so trying to retroactively apply what the data sheet for the steel said to the spec for the knife maker is ridiculous, presumptuous, and shouldn't happen. You know, there's there's a reason uh, there's a reason Chris Reeve wants his S35VN at 58 to 59 or 59 to 60. Now, people didn't agree with that when it was 58 to 59, but he did it for a reason. But a lot of it is to, is, is marketing. It's how am I going to sell a hundred and twenty eight dollar paramilitary two for one hundred and sixty bucks? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to add a dollar fifty to the steel cost. That's how, and I'm going to convince everybody they need to have the sprint run an M390. Is it going to perform any better? No, it's going to sell more knives. And 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 there we see the the collector's mind. You yeah. know, so just to, let's admit who we are. Let's not kid ourselves into thinking we really care. Yeah, that it, yeah. That it performs marginally better in no real world way. So uh, something you were just talking about, right? reminded me i wanted to ask you about uh um to me uh the best way to maintain is just kind of very frequent stropping not only do i find it soothing uh as a as an activity but uh i I, conceptually i like it it's just kind of straightening it out after uh, each time you kind of take it in after a day's worth of work if you if you're if you use it bring it home and strop it what do you think of stropping um I think it depends on how good a stropper you are. Mm -hmm. Number one, it's great. It's a great thing to do in between major sharpenings, as long as you're not rounding the apex. Yeah. Right. Um, If you're a, if you're like a compulsive stropper, you're going to have a round knife. I swear I'm not. (laughs) I swear. (laughs) You'll go blind. (laughs) Okay. Okay. It had to be said. All right. Uh, before we wrap up, I, I wanted to ask you what you what your 2020 picks are. Do you have anything coming up that you've seen uh, that you're excited about? Yeah, of course, the CPM 154 Gunny Sidekick by Bark River. I'm pretty oh, excited yes. about yeah. that. As am I. There's really one knife. That, there are two. There are two knives this year I'm pretty excited about. And one of them is really not 2020. I think it came out in 2019. The Mini Super Freak. Oh, yeah. You know, the small freak. Um, in M4 because I've been, I, I haven't been able to get my, 
my uh, full size super freak out of my pocket for about three weeks. Hmm. But every time I use it, I think, man, if it were just a little smaller. Uh-huh. So yeah, that one, and then I, I take no credit for this, even though it's exactly what I suggested they do. <laughs> okay. Let's hear it. When the when the Sabenza twenty five came out, and I reviewed it, I said it's not a Sabenza; it's a different knife. Hmm. A Sabenza has a bushing pivot. This knife does not. If they want to come out with a new Sabenza, whatever number it becomes when they do it, it needs to have a bushing pivot. But the ceramic ball bearing detent slash lock interface is a great improvement. So what do we have? We have a Sabenza 31, which is exactly that. The Bixby model. Uh, they, I did. I take no credit. I've never spoken to them about that. So. Uh, but it's exactly if I uh, I got to get one because it's the Sabenza I would have done next. Right. Yeah. But it's kind of a mythical character, isn't it? Do we have any yet? Or, or is it here yet? Well, I, I've been seeing Instagram pictures of uh, of the scales, uh, the the um, uh, the inlays being put in, and you know the new inlay pattern reminds me, you know, on the show side reminds me of um, like a car from the '30s. You know those big sweeping lines. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's real pretty. I, I, I would love to get, uh, yeah, a Sabenza 31, maybe a small one, because I have a 21, you know, a large one, maybe just to check out, and just to have that natural, I'm a micarta freak, and just to have that natural yeah. micarta on there would be nice. Yes, it would. And yeah, I remember when the Nkosi came out, which was the improved Sabenza 25, uh, I thought the inlay shapes were just horrendous to look at and now what four years later i look at them I'm like actually they kind of work yeah so, uh, the, the 31 i think we'll look at in five years and go of course they made it that shape All right yeah. it feels so natural now yeah just like these two kind of just strangely placed bars are so perfect yeah with this. with the hole to nowhere yeah with the hole to nowhere Sorry, sorry, people. I'm holding up my Sabenza 21 for Rob to see. So before we close, I want to do. I have the speed round okay. where where I just ask. Uh, you know, it's just a one word answer, and uh, I think I have. Uh, well, it's it's 16 questions that I ask, and I think I have it uh, pretty much. Uh, I change them every once in a while, but wow, just, 16. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. So fixed or folder? Yes. It's got to be one or the other. I know, I know. All knives, all the time. Yeah, folder. Flipper or thumb stud? Stud. Washers or bearings? Washers. Tip up or tip down? Up. Tanto or Bowie? <laughs> <laughs> Bowie. <laughs> Hollow ground or flat ground? Flat. Uh, full size or small? Well, after a freak discussion, small. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You have to be consistent. Yeah. Gentleman's knife or tactical knife? Gentleman's knife. Automatic or bally song? Automatic. Uh, ZT or Wii? ZT. Benchmaid or Spyderco? Oh, bah. <laughs> Come on. Oh, this one man. was for you. Benchmaid. Uh, okay, real steel or steel will? Two companies I always confuse. Steel will. Okay. Uh, milled titanium or spring clip? Spring clip. <laughs> Carbon fiber or micarta? Well, then you got to ask what does it need to do? But aesthetically, car yeah. or, uh, micarta. Okay. Finger choil or no finger choil? Finger choil. Form or function? function okay so and your desert island knife and that's just one knife for the rest of your life wow wow one knife the rest of my life desert island i don't own this knife but this would be it bark river bravo 1.25 and cpm 3v nice Okay. Okay. So that's the Bravo. That's a little longer than the than the regular so, one. Yeah, that's like the five and a half inch blade. Perfect. I think you can do. I think you can do everything with that knife. 
Perfect all arounder. Well, uh, so Rob, tell everyone where they can uh, find your work, find how to send you knives for sharpening. How can they find out more about you? And also, how can they find out about the pre-order for the BRK uh, for the uh, for the Gunny Sidekick you have coming out? Okay, so in almost every one of my YouTube videos in the description is a link to my rates and services video for the Apostle P Knife Service. Um, there's also a Facebook page for the Apostle P Knife Service that you can reach me at. Um, email addresses and phone numbers to text are in those in those two sources. Then there's a video I did, I guess a week or two ago about the pre-order for the gunny sidekick in CPM 154. Uh, you can either click through the link in that video description or it's pretty simple. You go to knife ship free is the exclusive retailer for that knife. Go to the bark river page, click on the gunny models and then, you know, find the pre-order for CPM 154, which is, I can find it. So all you guys can definitely <laughs> find it. Um, and, and you just go from there. And as usual, when those knives come in, if you want to have me sharpen it before it comes to you, there will be a way to do that too. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely something you want to take advantage of. Uh, Rob, thanks so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a pleasure talking to you at long last after watching so many videos. Absolutely. It's been great talking with you too, Bob. I've enjoyed it a lot. All righty, sir. You take care. You too. Thanks. Subscribe to the Knife Junkie's YouTube channel at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. All right, back on the Knife Junkie podcast, episode number 96. Bob, what did you think of that interview? You had a, finally had a chance to talk to the Apostle P. Oh, it was, it was great. And, uh, you know, at the outset, he busted me for my use of, of four, four, uh, $4 words there. And <laughs> it, it, I liked t- that. <laughs> yeah, I know you did. And uh, uh, it was funny to me. It, 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 uh, I was already comfortable talking with him beforehand. I already felt like I knew him before because right. I've watched so many videos. But that ribbon, I was like, "All right, let's have a conversation." And uh, it was it was really great to talk to him. He's a warm guy, and his knowledge is wide and deep on uh, knives and steels. And it was a great perspective. Right. One one thing, one key message, one key point, key takeaway from the interview. Well, I'm I'm going to use my Spyderco Sharp Maker in a different way after that hmm. interview. I'm going to start okay. focusing a little bit more on my on my fixed angle uh, sharpening system and not be so afraid of that and get that uh, get that optimized for me, and then use the Sharp Maker more as a um, maintenance tool rather hmm. than a from scratch sharpening tool, which is what okay. I've used it for. All right, so an educational podcast as well. Oh, that was good. Educational. <laughs> educational. Hey, uh, the weekend uh, episode of the Knife Junkie podcast is our interview show. Bob's got uh, several more interviews already in the can, several great interviews scheduled. But uh, if you have a suggestion that you would uh, like to hear somebody on the Knife Junkie podcast, shoot Bob an email at bob at the knifejunkie.com or call the listener line 724-466-4487 and let us know. We'd love to uh, talk to you or who you would like to hear on the Knife Junkie podcast. So for Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person. Thanks for joining us on the Knife Junkie podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.